You may have heard the phrase, perception is reality. Perhaps another way to look at it is that perception is the lens through which we view reality as it relates to things, people, concepts, and ourselves. Ingrid Bergman, a Swedish actress popular in the 1940s, observed that it's not whether you really cry, it's whether the audience thinks you are crying. So in reality, perception is everything. This lecture focuses on the basics of perception, specifically some key definitions and the basic stages. When you perceive something, your five senses gather data, and then you figure out what that data mean. When you focus that perceptual process on people, assigning meaning based upon verbal and nonverbal cues, it's called interpersonal perception. One study that looked at pairs of communicators, however, concluded that each communicator was able to interpret or explain just 25 to 50 percent of the other person's behavior, which is why you may find yourself pleading, look at it from my perspective. Understanding interpersonal perception can help us become more aware of why we view and evaluate others, as well as how they might be evaluating us, and we might also be able to affect others' perceptions of ourselves. Perception occurs in the decoding component of the basic communication model. It can be passive, you perceive things without conscious effort because your senses are operating, or active, you seek out specific information through conscious observation and questioning. Think about the difference as active perception being based upon motivation, while passive is based upon your senses doing what they are designed to do. For example, when you walk around campus, you will likely perceive other students milling around, heading in various directions. You are engaging in passive perception. But if you want coffee and you notice someone walking out of a building carrying a hot beverage cup and you simultaneously sniff the air to see if you can detect the aroma of freshly brewed coffee, you are engaging in active perception. You are motivated to notice or perceive your surroundings. There are three basic stages in the perceptual process. First, your brain selects from amongst all the information your senses have gathered. Then your brain has to organize that information so that finally you can interpret that information or try to make it make sense to you. Some scholars add additional stages such as memory, recall, response, and negotiation, but we will focus on these first three stages. Think about playing a game of cards. First, you have to get the cards to play. They can be given to you, passive perception, or you can select them active perception, and in some games, such as hearts, you may do both. Then you have to organize them to determine what you have. Depending upon the game, you may group cards of the same denomination together, set them up in a run such as 3, 4, 5, or something similar. If you're playing a card game like Rummy, for example, you may end up constantly rearranging your cards, because it is only when you have organized your cards that you can now interpret them or determine what they mean. Do you have a good hand or a bad hand? Then you do something with that interpretation, such as figure out your strategy on how to play that hand. Let's start with selection, where your brain pays attention to the information your senses have gathered. There are a few key terms you should know. First, selective perception means that we perceive things due to a variety of factors, such as our personalities, beliefs, cultures, experiences, etc. As a college professor, for example, my perception of appropriate work attire is likely different than that of a high-powered IBM executive. When you focus on specific stimuli while ignoring others, such as when you're driving, that's selective attention. We engage in selective exposure when we limit what we allow ourselves to be exposed to. Many people, for example, are surprised when their favorite political candidate doesn't win because virtually everyone they talk to said they were voting for that candidate. Well, we tend to associate with people who hold similar beliefs, so we select who and what we are exposed to. Finally, selective recall refers to what we remember or recall and what we do not. Oftentimes, we repress bad memories, but we may also block out or forget the good stuff or things we didn't consider to be relevant at the time. There is no way we can pay attention to all the stimuli around us. There's just too much going on. So we select what we will attend to or ignore, selective attention, based upon several factors. We tend to notice stimuli that are intense. Someone who speaks loudly or wears bright colors draws our attention. You'll likely also notice something or someone, like a classmate, if you are exposed to it multiple times, repetition. Advertisers are aware of this factor, which is why they air commercials multiple times. We also select based upon contrast or change. Unchanging things or people become less noticeable to us. If you wear cologne, for example, you likely don't notice it after a while and may reapply it, thinking that it's worn off. Once stimuli become familiar to us, we stop noticing them, a process called habituation. 
So we tend to notice things that are different, even if we can't put our finger on exactly what that difference is, like when someone gets a haircut or a new pair of glasses. If you're hungry, you're motivated to notice food. Looking for a relationship, you're motivated to observe people and the behaviors that hint that they are or are not eligible. Related to motives, we also pay attention to information that we're interested in. Notice that at a party where multiple people are holding conversations, you switch between who and what you are listening to based upon what you find interesting. Or you buy a car that you think is unique, only to discover that there are really lots of them on the road. They were there before, you just didn't select them. And we select based upon what we think we need to know. When my husband is driving, I don't pay much attention to what's happening on the road. But when my newly licensed daughter is behind the wheel, I have to stop myself from hyperventilating because I notice everything. We may not be able to select some stimuli due to our physiological limitations. Humans can't see bacteria, for example, which may lead us to believe our hands are clean when in fact they are not. But we also have physiological limitations as individuals. I wear corrective lenses, and without them, I am not only unable to read certain things, sometimes I can't even see or select them. Take the back of a $5 bill, for example. Until someone showed me, I was unable to see the names of the states on the top of the Lincoln Memorial. I thought they were just decorative lines. I had to use a magnifying glass, but lo and behold, they really are there. So I was unable to select this stimuli due to my physiological limitations. And finally, sometimes we see just what we expect to see. You may have seen this example before, but read these out loud very quickly. Here's the first, and the second, and the third. If you're like most people, you likely read all of these incorrectly. Paris in the the springtime, once in a a lifetime, and bird in the the hand. You didn't expect to see the double word, so you didn't. One more quick example. How many F's do you see in this? Stop the video and count. If you're like most people, you likely saw three. In fact, there are six. This is what likely happened. First, you saw the two Fs in finished files. In most cases, you would probably stop there. But this is an exercise in perception, so your expectation is that there must be more. Then you saw the F in scientific and stopped there. You selected what you expected to see. But you likely missed the three other Fs in of, of, and of. All of these examples have allowed you the perfect opportunity to select data. You knew you were being tested, so you were motivated to look, and you had as much time as you needed, and you still likely had difficulties with selection. Just think about what happens when you select data in interpersonal perception. In the second stage, organization, your brain takes the information your senses have selected and arranges it in a meaningful way, so that in the next stage, you can interpret it. We impose the familiar on the unfamiliar. When you play cards, do you arrange or organize your cards in your hand the same way, regardless of which game you're playing? No, because that makes it difficult for you to take the next step of doing something with that information. There are certain principles or rules our brains follow while organizing information. Let's look first at the concept of figure ground. The classical example is Ruben's vase. When you look at this picture, you might notice the vase first, and then the two faces, or vice versa. But notice that, unless you've done this before, when you focus on the vase, the two faces kind of fade away, becoming the background. In this case, the vase is the figure, while everything else becomes the ground. Unless we've been trained, it's very hard to pay attention to both the figure and the ground simultaneously. Remember we said that you can select based upon interest, as when you switch which conversation you pay attention to? The conversation you are currently listening to would be the figure, while the previous conversation would fade into the ground. Let me explain why this step is so important. Remember that the three basic steps in the perceptual process are selection, organization, and next, interpretation. How you organize what you've selected contributes to your interpretation. Looking at this tree, would you describe it as a big tree or a little tree? Okay, how about now? Is it big or little? And now? Notice that your interpretation of the tree's size depends upon the background. Your interpretation of something may depend upon what you are not consciously paying attention to. Let's get back to some of the methods we use to organize. With so much stimuli competing for our attention, we tend to group or categorize so that we can later make sense of it. For example, we may group people or things based upon proximity. 
Here your brain likely automatically groups this into three sets of parallel lines, rather than as six separate lines. You are organizing based upon proximity. Scientists have used the term perceptual schema to refer to the way we organize our perceptions about people. Pretend you're describing your mother to someone. You might describe her physically, such as young, tall, Hispanic, pretty, etc. If you mention that she's your mother, you are describing one of the roles that she performs. You categorize based upon social positions, including perhaps her employment status. If you describe how she interacts with others or her social behaviors, you might say that she is friendly, polite, sarcastic, or has a wicked sense of humor. If you put on your Sigmund Freud hat, you could describe her via her psychological traits, such as curious, confident, or neurotic. Once we've categorized, we link or connect those categories together. Another way to look at this is the process of what some scholars have called punctuation. Think of your English classes. This sentence takes on a completely different meaning when we add punctuation marks. Take this series of 11 numbers. You are more likely to interpret it as a telephone number if you punctuate it this way, especially if you're from the United States. In England, however, telephone numbers are punctuated differently. The typical example is a running argument between a husband and a wife. The husband complains that his wife is nagging him, while the wife responds that she is only nagging because the husband is withdrawing. Like the chicken and egg debate, the determination of what causes a behavior is based upon how you punctuate it. When does the event begin or end? Or for that matter, what behaviors do you categorize as relevant to the situation? Most of the time we have incomplete data with which to organize. In order to move to the next step, interpretation, we want closure, so we fill in the gaps. Look at this group of ink blots. Based upon proximity and imposing the familiar on the unfamiliar, you will likely complete the picture in your mind to conclude that it is a dog. Similarly, depending upon which way you look at this graphic, your brain will mold this center figure to create closure. Is it a B or the number 13? Once we have used a message to classify people, we then use that scheme to generalize about others who may fit into those categories so that we can predict what kinds of behaviors they may display. Be careful here, because if you go too far, you may end up stereotyping, creating an oversimplified image of someone, often on an easily recognizable characteristic, such as sex or race. While in selection and organization you identify, in interpretation you draw conclusions and evaluate. In a card game, it's when you decide whether you have a good hand or a bad hand. Several factors cause us to interpret an event in one way or another. Let's say my husband opens a package addressed to me. If I'm feeling good about our relationship, I might interpret this as helping me out. If, however, I feel dissatisfied or unsure of our relationship, that same behavior would be interpreted much more negatively. And let's be honest, I'm not always in a good mood. Not my husband's fault, usually, but my personal moods may cause me to view his behavior differently. Say I've never had the experience of opening a package before. I might interpret what he is doing as difficult and therefore conclude that he is being helpful. We all have different assumptions about humans and human behaviors. If I assume that people are nosy and can't be trusted, I might attribute a negative motive to his behavior. And if I have the expectation that my husband thinks I'm helpless and can't do anything, I might get defensive because I interpret his opening the package as verifying that perception. He thinks I'm helpless and that I need his help. And what we know or don't know might affect our interpretation. Maybe the package is from Amazon where the address on file is under my name. Perhaps our anniversary was coming up. And then instead of having negative thoughts, I might smile and think, what a wonderful husband he remembered. Quiz time. What are the three stages of the perceptual process in order? Can your interpretation influence what you select? Why is understanding the perceptual process important in interpersonal relationships? Our perceptions may not always be accurate. Understanding this process, however, may help you become a better receiver of information. By minimizing distractions, it may be easier for you to select important information to then organize and interpret. And as a source of information, you might be able to modify your behavior to make it easier for others to select what you want them to so that they have the information to organize and interpret. As the French writer Gustave Flaubert observed, there is no truth. There is only perception.